In this unit, we will fully explore the common law doctrine of consideration. Let's talk about consideration. But before, you, before we do, let's refresh our memories about our roadmap. Remember, we said a legally enforceable contract requires three things. Number one, there must be mutual assent. We have already discussed mutual assent in depth. Number two, the material terms of the contract must be reasonably certain. That's the issue of indefiniteness. We've already discussed indefiniteness in depth. Third, there must be consideration. This is the unit where we discuss consideration. Law professors love consideration. I'm really looking forward to this. All right, so what does it mean? What does consideration mean? Well, effectively it means that the promisee, right? We have a promisor and a promisee. A promise is only legally binding if the promisee pays for it. Once again, I'll say it again. A promise is only legally binding if the promisee pays for it. Now, you see that pays is in quotes. You don't have to actually give cash. The promisee must give something in exchange for the promise. Here's the big surprise, and it shouldn't be a big surprise, that the promisee can give a return promise, and that is sufficient consideration. Or the promisee can give return performance, and that will be sufficient consideration. That's all it means. And you're saying, what does that mean then? Well, effectively, it means that gift promises aren't enforceable. Why? Because in a gift, a promise to make a gift, the recipient of the gift, the promisee, doesn't give anything in exchange. So a gift promise is not enforceable. Now, hold on a second. You might say, well, wait a minute, gifts aren't enforceable? That means that someone can take back the gift they gave me? No, no. Gifts are enforceable. If you make a gift, that is a matter of property law. Once I transfer ownership of something to you, it is yours. So that's a matter of property law. Gifts are enforceable. They've already been given. But a promise to make a gift is not an enforceable promise. All right. Here are the topics that we are going to discuss in this subunit. First, we're going to look at the rule. We're going to actually look at the common law rule for consideration. Then we're going to go through various different examples and explore whether the contract is enforceable because there is sufficient consideration or whether it is unenforceable because there is no consideration. We're going to look at the gift promise. We already talked about this briefly. We're going to look at the promise to keep an offer open. Oh, we discussed this a little bit in unit three. We're going to discuss it again. Then we're going to try and get the parties straight. It's important when you do consideration analysis that you're able to spot who the promisor is and who the promisee is. And we're going to look at promisor and promisee in the bilateral contract situation, which is a little bit more confusing, but not that confusing. And we're going to look at the promisor and promisee in the unilateral contract situation, which is a little bit easier. All right, let's look at the common law rule for consideration. The first part is pretty easy. A promise is not legally binding unless it is supported by consideration. Memorize this rule. A promise is not legally binding unless it is supported by consideration. All right. A promise is supported by consideration if the promisee gives something of legal value in exchange. Three very important concepts in the rule. One, consideration analysis focuses on the promisee, not the promisor, the promisee. We want to know if the promise is enforceable. We need to look at what the promisee gave in exchange for the promise. It has to be something of legal value. Of course, cash is of legal value. You can give cash, but that's not what happens. We will discuss what sort of things uh, our legal value. And the legal value has to be given in exchange. We're going to explore each of these things, three things, the promisee, the legal value, and the, and the exchange in depth. 
All right, let's talk about the gift promise, right? We said a gift promise is not legally enforceable because it is not supported by consideration. Well, let's look at an example. So Mary says to Bob, Bob, I promise to give you a car for your birthday next month. Well, we know the rule is, is that Mary's promise will be enforceable if the promisee gives something of legal value in exchange for the promise. Here, Mary is the promisor, so we're not focusing on her. We're focusing on Bob. Bob is the promisee. What did he give in exchange for the promise? And you look at the fact pattern, pattern and he gave nothing in exchange for Mary's promise to make a gift. Therefore, Mary's promise is not supported by consideration. This is the language used. And because it's not supported by consideration, it is not enforceable. We do not have a contract. All right, let's look at a promise to keep an offer open. We discussed this in unit three. Let's go over it again. Mary says to Bob, Bob, I offer to sell you my house for $200,000. I will keep this offer open until October 1st. Was Mary legally obligated to keep her offer open to October 1st? Could she revoke the offer on September 1st, which she tried to do? Well, remember the rule. The promisee must give something in exchange for the promise. If the promisee does not give something of legal value in exchange for the promise, the promise is not supported by consideration and therefore it is not enforceable. Here, the promise is Mary's. Mary is the promisor. She promises to keep the offer open. We don't focus on Mary in consideration analysis. We focus on Bob, the promisee. What did Bob give Mary in exchange for her promise to keep the offer open? Bob gave Mary nothing in exchange for her promise to keep the offer open. Therefore, Mary's promise to keep the offer open is not binding. She can revoke the offer at any time. All right, when you do a consideration analysis, it's important for you to be able to identify who the promisor is and who the promisee is. So the bilateral contract situation is a little bit more difficult. It's not very difficult, but it's a little bit more difficult. So let's review. Here's a fact pattern. Bob says to Mary, I promise to paint your house. Mary says, I promise to pay you $5,000. All right, so now here's the question. Is Bob the promisor or is Bob the promisee? That's a trick question. Bob is both a promisor and a promisee. With respect to the promise, I promise to paint your house, Bob is the promisor. With respect to the promise, I promise to pay you $5,000, Bob is the promisee. All right, what about Mary? Well, I already gave it away by pressing the button early, but you knew that this was coming. Mary is both a promisor and a promisee. With respect to the promise, I promise to pay you $5,000. Mary is the promisor. With respect to the promise, I promise to paint your house. Mary is the promisee. All right, now just quick practice. If I want to know, is Bob's promise enforceable? What's the question you have to ask? Well, you have to ask, did the promisee give something in legal value uh, in exchange for Bob's promise? Did Mary give anything in exchange for Bob's promise? That's the question you need to ask. And here the answer is yes. Mary did give something in exchange. What did she give in exchange? She gave a promise to pay $5,000 in exchange. All right, a little bit further practice might be too easy now. Is Mary's promise to pay $5,000 legally enforceable? What do you have to ask? Did the promisee give anything in exchange for that promise? Who's the promisee? Bob. Did Bob give anything in exchange for Mary's promise to pay him $5,000? Yes, he did. He promised to paint Mary's house. That is something of legal value. We'll explore legal value in depth later. Now, let's move on to 
unilateral contracts. All right, it's much easier to spot the promisor and promisee in unilateral contracts. Here's an example. Let's assume that Mary is a summer legal intern for a big law firm and Bob is the managing partner at the law firm and Bob has already made an offer to Mary saying to Mary, Mary, when you graduate next May, you will come work here and I will pay you a fantastic salary. But I want you to keep working hard in law school. I don't want you to give up now and just say, okay, I can rest on my laurels because I already have a job. So if you graduate first in your class, I will give you a $10,000 bonus, right? That is an offer seeking performance. That is an offer from Bob seeking to form a unilateral contract. It's the incentive offer. The facts say that Mary did indeed graduate first in the class, so now Bob is bound. All right, is Bob a promisor or a promisee? Well, if you said both, you're wrong. In this case, Bob is just a promisor. Remember, in the unilateral contract, the offeree makes no promises. So Bob is only a promisor. Mary, on the other hand, is only a promisee. Mary made no promises. So in the unilateral contract situation, it's easy for us to spot the promisor and the promisee. Now, here's the quick question. Is Bob's promise to pay Mary $10,000 legally enforceable? Well, what do we have to ask? Did the promisee give anything of legal value in return? So did Mary give anything in legal, excuse me, did Mary give anything of legal value in exchange for Bob's promise? And the answer is yes. She performed and she accomplished the, the condition. She graduated first in her class. Therefore, Bob's promise is supported by consideration and it is legally binding.